Third of the town biologically. <laughs> I was related to another third of the town through marriages and unions of families. And for the third of the town that I was not related to, they were considered the newcomers. In the year 2000, on my mother's side of the family, uh, we numbered 1,700 in descendants from one man who immigrated to the colonies back in 1767. Now, out of those 1,700 descendants, 1,100 of those descendants come from my great-great-grandfather. We're very prolific on that side of the family, on my side of the family. And I guess, being a grandfather of 22 grandchildren, we're carrying on the tradition just as well as it has been for the last four generations. So when I read stories about Abraham and Sarah, the church's founding patriarchs and matriarch, I so understand the concept of God's promise to him about his offspring numbering more than the stars in the sky. This promise was given to Abraham because of his faithfulness to God. <laughs> The promise of ancestors that scripture talks about, I believe, refers to more than just the biological offspring of Abraham. I believe it refers to all who believe in Abraham's God. Scripture once refers, or often refers, to defining of a family beyond biology. There is also a spiritual binding that can define family that is as deep as any biological DNA. We call that the family of faith. This morning's scripture reading is dealing with faith and faithfulness. Abraham and Sarah, although well beyond childbearing years, were promised descendants beyond their wildest dreams. All because Abraham and Sarah put their faith in something that they could not see. They never even got to settle in the promised land that God was directing them to. But they never stopped working their faith in the promises that God gave them. The story says... These heroes all died still clinging to their faith, not even receiving all that had been promised to them. But they saw beyond the horizon the fulfillment of their promises and gladly embraced it from afar. So a couple of years ago, the new battle cry in this country became Make America great again. Now, whether you personally buy into this battle cry or you are repelled by it, it is a statement that must be deeply looked at to understand what is truly behind those words. What do those words really mean? We as humans create boundaries and rules of societal behavior as a way of keeping balanced and being grounded. I believe that's what the real message of this slogan is. It's asking, what are the rules? I don't understand the rules anymore. What is the foundation that I can rely on? In the 1950s, everybody understood what the social norms were. Because of societal rules and norms, everybody knew how to react to various situations that one would meet on their daily living. But you know, all that started to change in the 1960s as our society began a major social revolution. And every aspect of life has been challenged in what its norms were. 
Even mainline denominations have also been affected in this revolution, and most have been slow to react and embrace the challenge of change, which is still happening. We are still in this social revolution. It hasn't settled down yet. Historian Diana Butler Bass points out that about every 500 years, this church specifically goes through a major shift in both thought and in function. And that it last happened 500 years ago, and out of it came the Protestant movement. The Christian church is once again in the midst of a spiritual shift in the way things are being done. This church, our little faith community, this family of faith is no exception to this shift. You see, the rules have all been changing for us as a congregation. Like Abraham, as a congregation, you have stepped out in faith a couple of years ago, specifically, to follow God's call to a new future. A future that, at the moment, is filled with anxiety, uncertainty, fear about what it's going to turn out to look like, and not even knowing what we do next. How do we accomplish the future? In last week's special business meeting, these emotions could be seen through all of the questions and the statements that were being presented during that meeting. This morning's title of my reflection God isn't interested in churches, isn't just my trying to come up with some catchy phrase. It is a statement that asks the deepest question a congregation needs to ask and answer for itself. It is a question of why. Why do we exist as a church? Why do we exist as United Congregational Church? What is our faithfulness? We have so often worry about the numbers in worship on any given Sunday, but that is not where we should be concerned about. What we need to be concerned about is how do or did the church ministry, how did the church ministry get accomplished over the past week. Some people equate coming to church as a ministry of the church. That's not what worship is about. Worship is about praising God, uh, taking time to reflect on how God has interacted in our lives during the week and how we, as a church, have interacted in other people's lives during the week. You see, God isn't interested in churches. God is interested in relationships. Yesterday's activity of passing out water is an example of relationships. Through the simple act of passing out water, it allowed those of you who were involved to talk about this church and what it's about. The church exists for one purpose only, and that is to do ministry, to do relationship. Worship is not ministry. It is a time of coming together and rejoicing about how God's love has been enacted during the past week. As we seek to find answers about what our future is, we as the church body need to come together and have sacred conversations as a whole unit, not just 15 or 20 of us, but all of the 60 and 80 and 100 of us. 
about why we as a united congregational church are here. What justifications are there for us to exist? We cannot move forward into the future by living in the past. Questions on how we survive another year should not be the deep question of this faith family, but rather, what is our reason to exist as a faith, as a family of faith? What is our mission here in Grand Island? I shared with you a few weeks ago the short review of how three different congregations found their way to become this congregation. Uh, thanks to uh, Deb Rakowski, who found a bunch of pictures and put them up out in Fellowship Hall. I have moved that here to the front of the foyer, so when you're leaving today, you can kind of look at some of that history. Our ancestors in faith had a vision on what they were to do. And I'm pretty sure that in each step forward toward the future, there was just as much uncertainty about how they were going to accomplish their vision. As a body of faith, it is our responsibility to honor our ancestors of this congregation by once again doing the hard work of figuring out the why we exist. Abraham heard God's call to develop a mighty nation. Through faith he persevered in following that, or, uh, yes, through faith he persevered in following that faith, not knowing where he was going or how to even get there. His sons continue to follow in that faith. We are the inheritors of that original faith. We are the ones who are responsible to work our faith. A faith that not only honors our ancestors' faith, but honors God's promises to us. Do you have doubts about the future? Are you fearful about change? <laughs> oh, my beloved, you're in very good company because that's what it means to walk by faith, to believe in the promise of God, even when we are unsure about where that promise is leading us. Scripture says, so because of this faith, God is not ashamed in any way to be called our God, for she is preparing a heavenly city for the family to dwell in. <coughs> what greater promise is there than that? That we are part of the city that is being prepared. That's our future.